All right. Good evening, everyone. And this is the session number two for dynamic programming that we've been discussing um, for one week. And in the previous session, I let me know if you're able to constantly see my screen. I'm sharing a text editor right now. Earlier, there was a yeah. sharing problem as well. All right. So <clears throat> we looked at the basic of basics of DP, right? What dynamic programming is. And essentially, when you have a type of problem in which there are multiple sub problems, overlapping sub problems. So uh, let me actually back up a bit. If you have a problem where there is an optimal substructure, that is, you can ask the similar question for a problem of a smaller size and the prop sub problems are overlapping. That is, you're again and again solving the same sub problems. Then dynamic programming, what it does is it adds a little bit of caching to your solution and thereby you don't have to recompute the problems again. And uh, instead you can just visit your cache for the previously computed solution, thereby making your solution considerably faster. Considerably faster. Uh, so the algorithms that we have seen so far which were pretty simple ones. Essentially, uh, just give me a second. All right. Essentially, the problem that we saw, they were two to the power n type of solutions were converted to uh, linear time. So that's a huge amount of saving. The It comes with the cost of space where you have to introduce another some space for your caching. And this is usually in the form of an array or a 2D array or something like that. It can be dictionary as well, but essentially, yeah, that's the, that's the bottom part. So now, we saw two approaches to solve problems, right? So there is a prob approach of top down and bottom up. So for some problem, right? Let's say there is some problem and I ask you to solve this problem for N. If you start recursively with calling, let's say problem of N minus one or problem of N minus two like that, then you are essentially going top down. Whereas if you start from your base case, let's say the base case is one and then you build solution for two, then three and then so on for n and you give the answer back, then this is the bottom up approach. That's the very basic, that's the simplest understanding of a top down bottom up approach. This problem is, this approach is sometimes also referred to as memoization. That is we're storing the results of previous functions. For example, this is the function, then we're storing the result of previous function. And this was historically called dynamic programming but both, both are essentially the same thing. And we both of them are broadly referred to as dynamic programming. Let's look at new class of problems today. All right, and uh, there are three or four type of problems, different category of problems that usually come with TP. I mean, there, are, there may be many more. I'm not that uh, aware of the entire breadth of the topic, but usually what gets asked is in the domain, three or four domains. So let's look at the second type of problem today, which is, uh, I call like number of ways. There are problems that usually ask you to solve a solution for number of ways in which a thing can be done. All right, so let's take the very first example. Suppose that there is a staircase, All right? There is a staircase. And let's say this is the first stair, and then this is the second stair, this is the third, fourth, and so on. Some end stairs are there. And then there is a, let's say, kid standing here. Whatever. Now, the problem is, it's, I mean, the, the, the condition is that the kid can at a time either go to one stair or the kid can also jump to second stair or to the third stair. 
at a time kid can make any decision let's say kid can go to one stairs or two stairs at a time or three stairs jump directly to three stairs any of these decision can be made given this is the situation that kid can go to one or two or three stairs at a time in how many ways kid can reach to n stairs how many ways so that's a type of problem if you get to the heart of this type of problem you're solving then you will solve a lot of different problems that are on the same uh, type of template that i will share with you later on but essentially that's the problem now let's look at this problem recursively this problem can be solved iteratively also this problem can be solved but how okay so let's visit this problem a kid can go one two or three stairs at a time then how many ways kid can reach n stairs can we solve this problem whenever you see such a problem do not jump to answer in your mind like don't go right away thinking how to solve this problem in one shot make the problem smaller size ask yourself a question this question is valid if there was only one stair if there was only one stair in how many ways kid can get to this point there is only one way to jump to stair number 1 that's the only way to jump to this stair all right so instead of this i am just going to draw a table let's say if there are one there was one stair and you can say num of ways and let's say stairs let's say there is one stair then there is one way only to get to the stair if there were two stairs then in how many ways can kid get to this place so one way can be that hang on let me just delete this ah i don't know what's going on with my eraser here so the one way can be to you have to reach here so one way can be to go to this stair and then go to this stair like one stair at a time or this another way can be to just directly go to stair number 2 so there are two ways in which you can get to stair number 2 right so for stair number 2 there are two ways right so in this way you can construct the solution all right let's get rid of this and let's do this again instead of stairs what i'm going to write consider all of these stairs to be horizontal like an array and this is let's say zeroth position this is one position 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and n like that so once again the kid is here can go to stair number 1 in one way can go to stair number 2 in two ways in how many ways can the kid go to stair number 3 we are just playing around the problem for now <coughs> well one way can be to go this way that's one way the other way can be to jump to this and take one step the another way can be to jump this and take another step right so three so far and then another way can be to basically sorry just go these stairs directly so there are how many ways four ways is 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 that i mean if there is a question let me know so in three stairs that's the total set the kid can go here now let's expand the problem even further in how many ways can actually kid reach the stay number 4 okay to make it simpler i'm just going to write it here okay the one way can be that kid can go 1 2 3 and 4 the another way can be two steps at a time so kid can do 1 2 in a shot and then 3 4 or kid can do 1 2 3 and 4 or 1 2 3 4 
right? And then kid can do two steps at a time. So one, two, three, four. That's the only possibility with two steps or kid can go three at a time. One, two, three and four or one, two, three, four. How many ways are there? I don't think there is anything else. There are seven ways total now. So you get the idea of what we are doing here. You can get to step number four in seven ways. If you try to solve this problem like this, humanly, it is only possible till very, to very small numbers. But if you go slightly more further, this problem will become very hard to solve it like this. To understand this type of problem, you need an observation. And the observation is always for this type of problem is to think about for any step n. If some person was to make just one step from their position, then from how many positions can they reach this point? n position point. They can either come from n minus one, n minus two, or n minus three, because they only can jump three steps at a time, maximum. Right? That's the only possibility. No person from n minus four can directly come here. Right? So if I can find out the number of ways to get to seven, six and five, then I can just sum those ways and get the answer here. For example, for four, we can calculate like this, this type of an approach, but I'm not going to do this. At step number four, person can come from three, two, or one, right? Either they go through path of one, two, or three in however ways you want, but they can reach here through these three positions. So if I know the number of ways person can get here, here, and here, then I can sum those and get the answer. For example, one, two, and three, right? This goes to how many? Six. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Wow, well, I'm mistake. One, two, and four, seven. And that is the number of phase here. Any questions so far? So we have a limitation that the kid can jump only three steps maximum. Either one, yeah, yeah, either one, two, or maximum three steps at a time. Okay. And that's why when we are going to eight, we are just taking the lower limit at five. That's right. That's right. So for any n, a person can could have come from either n minus one, n minus two, or n minus three. So if we can compute these values and then add those, then there is no other way for that n to a person to come from uh, to n. Okay. Great. So essentially, if you understand this substructure, that for solving n, you need to find for seven, for six, for five. So that means problem can be lowered in size all the way to one. And then you can compute backwards to find the answer. The models that I showed you last class for Fibonacci are in, in the same coding template will always, always work uh, for all these problems. Let's try to solve this in some, let's, let's, let's try to code this. All right. Uh, let me put, my ID up. Uh, I have one question on this. Yes. Uh, we move on. Yeah, I, actually I got it like uh, how you are trying to uh, solve the problem. But uh, how do you, how you are coming to a conclusion that uh, <laughs> yeah. n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, when you see a problem, because that is a, a kind of a solution for a lot of problems, right? How do you come to an arise? Is it like by practice or by, uh, maybe just a thinking or so there is definitely a part of practice, but so let's consider this problem, right? Uh, or let's consider any problem Fibonacci, for example, the Fibonacci, any number is the sum of N minus one and N minus two, right? So compute N, we have to get N minus one and N minus two and plus them in, in this problem, the person can either come from one step, two steps or three step before that step. So it has to be n minus one, which is this n minus two, n minus three. As you solve more and more problems in these sessions, you will get this idea that how to approach this kind of problem. The second problem is going to be in two dimensions. And then we will see uh, 
in that aspect as well, how to get to this position. So let's, uh, let me save this. And let's call this uh, stairs dot py. All right, so assume this, I'm going to define a function, okay? It's, this function is, I call it NOW, number of phase, okay? Don't, let me actually write this, num of ways. Let's say this, we have a function which takes in this argument as N, and then somehow magically it returns the answer, the number of ways you are going to reach this place. And suppose that, uh, let's take, let's call this function, num underscore of ways with, let's say four. Now we need to code this way, that what are we going to do here to return the answer here correctly. So number of ways n, right? The first thing that we need to do is, is to say, for example, I can say, uh, I'm just gonna call this, uh, that's okay, let's call it number of ways. No, I actually change it because it will be easy for me to write. I'm just gonna call it now, number of ways. Okay, and I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> All right. What do we know? That the, that the person can go to step number one, two or three. Those are our base conditions here. So we need to know the answer for those three, right? So I'm going to say, if n equals equals one, then basically return one. I'm just gonna use the same line, return one. If n equals equals two, then return two. And if n equals equals three, then return three then return four, right? So those are the base conditions. Now I can just write one expression that return number of ways of n minus one plus number of ways of n minus two plus number of ways of n minus three. That's pretty much it. This is the base condition and this is the recursive step here. <coughs> Whatever needs to be computed will be computed with these recursive calls. Let's just print. There is no DP so far. It's just a pure recursion approach. Let's see, number of ways for four, what happened? What did I mess up? Oh, sorry, my mistake. Def define number of ways. Seven. So number of ways you can reach, step number four is seven. Let's also print something. Okay, let's just print this. What we are doing here is, uh, let's, just bear with me for a second. might be getting the idea what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to print all the recursive calls that are going to happen in this case. Where are we? Now off. So I'm just printing. <coughs> Sorry, let me just bring it to the same line. It's not needed, but let's just run this code again. I've messed up something, just give me a second. No, this will work, whatever I didn't. So 
sorry about that. Uh, is this a Python language? I'm sorry because I've, I've yes, just... this is Python language. Yes, that's correct. Uh, okay, I'm familiar with C sharp, so I'm just trying to find. Yeah, this is Python language. So let me just fix this real quick. <coughs> you can notice that one function was called now three, now two, and now one. Sorry for the delay, but yeah. What I want to give you is an idea of how many times these functions are being called. So let's do this for maybe eight. And let's run this. Now notice how many times this function is being called. So first it's being called for seven, six, and five, then six, five, four, then five, four, three, and then notice this is being called so many times to get the answer. And how many number of times this three is being called? Look, three. Three, uh, no, three is fine actually, three is the base condition, but how many times four is being called? Four, 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 and every time this four is evaluated. Now this is the classical recursion problem that we are trying to solve in the DP. <clears throat> that we want to introduce some kind of a caching so that we don't have to commu compute this again and again. Right, so instead of this, I'm going to construct a bottom-up approach, sorry, a top-down approach, and my top-down approach is going to be something like this. So what I'm going to do is number of ways of let's say n, somebody says n, then I'm going to construct a cache of items. And these I will initialize to one, two, and four. Now what I will do is when I call this n, I will check, let's say these are all initialized to, rest of the items are initialized to zero. I will check whether the Let's call this memo. Whether the memo of n is equal to equal to zero or not. If it is zero, then I need to evaluate the n minus one position of this array instead of calling the function again, but just n minus one position of array. If it is if it is not zero, that means we have some answer there, then don't do anything. Don't call any function, just return the stored value. Right? So initially when we call n, let's say eight or something, then eight will not have an answer. So eight will call seven, six, and five. It will compute seven, six, and five positions. And in the same way, you will keep computing. For example, let's say I was to say, what is now of four? I will first check, check if the memo of four exist or not. This, this index, four index, don't worry about the actual indexing, there is a zero, but I'm saying if memo of four does exist or not. If it does not exist, then essentially, I'm going to say memo of four equals to memo of three, two, and one. This, and get the answer in one shot, instead of computing this value again and again. Right, so that's my strategy. So once again, it's gonna look exactly similar to how Fibonacci would look. So let's get, <clears throat> rid of this guy and say let's write another function this time the function is going to take a array as well to this input okay so in python you have this liberty to define a function within a function but what i'll do is i will not do that i will because once again there are other people people from other programming language background i will just stick to standard programming approaches let's just say Let's just leave it like this. And I'm going to define a new function. It's called def now underscore dp. Okay. And this, what it does is it takes this and it takes an array with it. How does this array get initialized? We'll take care of it in a second. Now, first thing is the base condition, right? We're going to say this thing, the same thing. Then we are going to say, from here onwards, we'll just say, if memo of, let's say, whatever, n equals equals zero, that means if this has not been initialized so far, then let's, if this, this has not been filled right uh, so far, then its value should be now underscore dp of n minus one memo, plus now underscore dp 
of n minus 2 memo plus now underscore dp n minus 3 memo. So <clears throat> compute its value. All this is doing is just compute its value and then return memo of n. So now my code looks something like this. So instead of just calling recursion, I'm storing the results of recursion in an array, which array is called memo. If this value is not initialized, then this value is equals to this. Now, when you do this again, for example, in the previous case, you will see this four was computed so many number of times. This time, once the four is evaluated, it will not need to be computed. Why? Because the moment you see n equals to four, for example, here, four memo, then it will come here and will say, okay, this is not zero. So hence we have computed it and return memo of n. Let's just call this again with <clears throat> now of eight, let's say with some array, okay? And I'm going to define this array as, let's say array equals to, I'm just going to define an array with of size plus one, whatever the size is. I'm going to generalize this even further, but just don't worry for now. Let's just take this example. All right, so let's run this code. Let's see how this works. And the answer is 81. And what are we returning? here print now of eight not array but just now of eight comma now yeah, yeah, now eight. underscore dp comma array yeah let's run this code and you will see 81 81 so it is computing again but this time your cache is is working. And this is the standard template of coding these problems. <clears throat> this is the top down approach. Once again, we are from n, we are going n minus one, n minus two and n minus three. So we are going from top down to the base case. What we can also do is let's just say print uh, now underscore let print n comma memo. Let's just print that for now. And let's get rid of the first case so that we don't have too much of logging. And run this code. So notice what happens here. First we run for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then we go here, building the solution. Look how this cache is being built up like that. And you finally have 81 as the answer. So that's for a solution of eight. Any questions in this one? So this is your memo array, how it's built. So you have this, what I could have also done is I could have initialized memo to something and then you would have seen the array. Let's say I, I could have said here that array of zero equals to zero, array of one equals to one and array of two equals to two and array of three equals to four. So you'll run and then you will, this is how your array will look like. <clears throat> right, so no more exponential number of operations now. Uh, uh, but why we have calculated like uh, the array of three is uh, two plus one plus uh, like uh, four. Because array of three cannot be just two plus one because remember the person also have the capability to mm -hmm. jump three oh. steps. 
Okay, I got, I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Because we need to define the values for the first three because uh, right. Already evaluated. I got it. Yeah. Right. So now one important thing: when you are asked this question, or this is in lead code, or something like that, what you will have to do is you will have to you will be asked to code in this function, right? This function. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to write another auxiliary function like this and then call this function from this. So I'm going to get rid of this. And here you will do the work. What you will do is you will create some kind of a memo. So memo equals to, let's say you initialize it with zero and you say n plus one. I'm saying n plus one because indexes go from zero to n minus one. And I want the zeroth index to be there as well. And what you will do is you will say now underscore DP of n comma memo. Essentially, so you get rid of all of this here. And you just call this now underscore DP. So the caller has absolutely no idea how this is being done internally and you are internally initializing an array and then you're passing that array to a different function and you can just always say like memo of whatever one equals one and you can let me just write it m or two equals to two and m memo of three equals to four like that <clears throat> so let's run this code again and make sure that it's working fine ah, what happened are we not printing now of, oh, so, sorry, my mistake, return of this. Return of this guy and let's run this code, 81, right? Let's so you, go you don't need the if condition anymore, right? If, the, if you are initializing. That's correct. Right. We don't need the if conditions anymore if we are initializing, that's right. We can just get rid of all of this. So that's correct, that's exactly correct. And the very first step is the caching and then you get the answer. So now look how this has become. You, you create a cache, you initialize the cache and then you just call a DP method, which is filling the cache further. So if that element of the cache is not present, then you find the values that will fill that element and hence you get the answer. So that's a DP. I turned the basic program. It's pretty good. Solution. Sorry, was it that a question? Program if there is a question, I cannot understand. Okay, that's the top down approach, all right? First, before going to the bottom up approach, what would be the time complexities? Let's look at the recursive code and then let's look at the, this course we are slightly behind the time. So let me speed up a bit. Suppose when you're solving the problem for N initially, then that problem needed the computation of N minus one, N minus two and N minus three. This n minus one further needed the computation of n minus two, n minus three, and n minus four. And this goes forward till one. Similarly, these trees will, would also be have to be expanded. So just pure brute force recursion, you can see that each step results in three child. The next step will be nine child, that is, each level is this, and then you get nine here. And then three to the power of three, and then you go like that. Till what length? The depth of the tree will be n, because here this is n, n minus one, n minus two, till you get n minus n minus n, which is zero. So you go to the height of n. So that's total complexity, three to the power n, that's exponential complexity. Let's look at the dynamic programming solution. What you have is an array and of size n, n plus one, but it doesn't matter. Asymptotically it's n. And you, when you want to compute n, you look to these three. If you cannot find this, then you look for these three here and you go back like that. The good thing is you never compute a value more than once. So you go back, you, this, is there. So when you come here, you sum these value, this becomes seven. Then you come here, you sum these value and this becomes seven for 11 and 13. Like that you move forward. 
So at each step, you are doing for these n steps, you are doing a sum of n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus three. That's all that you're doing. Making it a linear time algorithm. Any questions in this? And once let's say four is computed like this, once let's say four is computed, four, fourth item is computed, for any of the further cases, you can just refer here and get the answer in O1 time instead of going through the recursion. <clears throat> now let's look at the bottom up approach to solving the same problem. What would be the bottom up approach is usually the iterative approach. That is, you begin with the base conditions. This is one, two, and four. Then instead of <clears throat> recursively coming down, you start from here at this point and you go till you find, till you get to the value n and then you report the answer for n. So what is four? Four is last three. What is five? Last three, whatever. This last three till you reach the n point. At n, you get the answer of the previous sum. So you just run one for loop <clears throat> and then each item is the sum of the previous three items and you plus those three items and you get the answer. I will just quickly code this one as well, okay? Let's just say, I'm just gonna write another method and let's just save it as stairs underscore iterative dot py. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna say a number of ways. N, okay, this is my function. I'm writing in Python, so this is how we define a function. Now, in order, if I want to compute this, somebody, let's say, is calling me with, let's say, number of ways for whatever, five, and I need to print this. Then what I will do in this function is, is a common template. First, I will once again initialize an array. Okay, let's call this array as memo again. And let's say zero multiplied by n plus one. And then you initialize that array. You say, memo, let me just copy the code from here instead of writing. Now, at this point, you write a for loop. You will say for x in range from four to n plus one. Okay. And you just write memo of x is equals to memo of x minus one. x minus two and x minus three, right? So you have no problem that you cannot run over the bounds here because you're beginning from four. So you're gonna compute three, two and one. And then just finally just return memo of n. Let's run this and you get the 13 as the answer. So this is the bottom up approach. That you begin at the bottom, you know the base conditions and you build the solution from there till you reach n. And at n, basically you print, you get it on your answer. Any questions, first of all, in the bottom up approach? And this is, this is my, in, compared to in the two approaches, this is slightly favorite of mine. I try to go with this approach most of the times. Uh, this would be my first attempt like in any of the problems that we see to start from the base condition and go towards the solution, but different people according to their own like uh, background or uh, whatever they feel comfortable with, people choose either or doesn't matter. <clears throat> One drawback of, I will tell you recursive approach 
that has always been that we always discussed they discussed in the previous solution as well when you're computing this kind of a solution right you need an extra space for an array right so let's say if the problem was size was n then you required a size n array right so that o n space extra was needed in recursion what will happen is they apart from this there always be a cost of extra space for function stack right in the recursion lecture i showed this in detail that if you are calling f of let's say 5 and then f of 5 calls f of 4 then essentially this guy goes on a stack right with the return position known if this guy calls f of 3 then this essentially goes on the top of the stack that's how computers remember how to fetch the previous function back so if this whatever the size is let's say n size is n minus 1 and then if you go all the way to 1 then the stack size will also be n so that's a drawback with the recursive call but the advantage of the recursive call is that they can be more readable right when you write the code the code is slightly more readable so that's this first example the number of ways in which you can climb stairs and uh, if you're climbing one two or whatever and i can what i can do is i can after that i can share the link of some lead code problems or some other places where you can solve the similar type of problems let me take an example of a different type of problem i'm going to revisit this problem again by the way because um, there is a variant of this problem that i would like you to look at as well let's consider this let me copy a grid from here so you must have seen this problems this type of problem in in dp several times in past i guess but let me just write the statement this problem you have this grid okay it has these are the columns of the grid and these are the rows and there is let's say some object here some robot or something some human or some insect or whatever here and let's say this is the source and this guy wants to reach here the target this is the target the only thing is this object can either move one step to the right or one step in the bottom this thing can only go one step to the right or one step in the bottom so given this in how many number of ways can this object reach the target like what are the different unique routes possible for this object to get to here for example this is one route and this is another route All right and let's say the object can come here then come here then come here then come here like that and that can be another route that's a unique route or the object may choose to uh sorry uh come here and then come all the way here and then go like this that's another route so you can say that's pretty mathematically tough i'm not hum for a human mind to solve this problem unless it's super small in size so the question comes in how many number of ways can you solve this can this this robot reach from source to target okay this is a common problem and then there are a lot of variations of this problem as well that we that i want to cover as well later on so how do we approach such a problem we approach it this problem if you don't know it looks complicated it's not complicated and once again we approach it in the similar way as we did in the previous problem 
if we begin with the most simplest of the possible cases suppose that there was only one cell suppose that there was only one cell then in how many ways can this point reach from this cell to this cell and the answer is there is only one way to reach to where you are where you are to uh, that that's the target given you can only move right and the bottom one way if this cell had a cell adjacent to it then in how many ways can you reach this point can anybody tell me anyone any idea in how many ways can we reach this yeah, cell only one only one that's correct right there is only one way you can get to this point there is no other way if let's say there was a cell here then in how many ways can you get here one again yeah if this was a cell here then in how many ways can you get to this point two two so one way can be this guy and the another way is this guy there is no other way the point can the robot can only move right and down so there are the other two ways in which you can get here right to this point let's take this problem a little further into analyzing that right? you take your time to analyze these problems let's take a grid of size 3 once again let's say you are here and you want to get here now how many ways you can reach here so let's that's that can be one way that can be two ways right so we have two ways now what can be the third way so there can be another way right we can what we can do is we can go here come down here go here and come down here that's another way or we can decide to let's say go down here and then merge in this path again that's fourth way or we can uh let me choose some or we can say is there any other way first of all do we think that there is any other way left yeah middle down yeah that's right middle to down so you you can come here and then you can go down 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 here and then you can reach here right that's another way do you think any other way is left i mm. yeah like a uh, from the second row third right uh, and you can take bottom and go so you can come here 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 and here like that right Yeah, and one. Uh, yeah, and there is one more is also left, which is go to the end on the right side, like here. Yeah, go down. Uh mm huh. -hmm. And left. No, you cannot go left. Uh, we cannot go left, right? Yeah. <clears throat> right, only right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think call. Let's find out. But you can see how complicated this problem can be. How complicated this problem can be. but let's take an example a one example before this right so there are two ways to get here let's go once again remember the previous problem how i approached it i approached it from the target let's take this again let's say if a guy was to reach here like if the robot was to reach this place how could have the robot come here there are only two possibilities to come here either through here or either through here right there is no other possibility so if we can compute the number of ways the robot can reach this position and this position and i can just plus those positions then i will get the answer right so let's take this a little further let me copy that grid again real quick let's say this is a square grid for now 
Oops. Right. So I'm here. I can only get from here or from here. So if I add these two, then I will get the answer. Right. If suppose this is whatever, this is one, one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five. Then if I want to get to five, five, then the only way to get here is either through four comma five or five comma four, right? This is five comma four and this is four comma five, right? If I sum these two somehow, then I will get the answer. Okay, but I don't know the answer to this. How then we ask the same question again to this position. In how many ways can I get to this position? I could have come here from here or here. So this leads to two more calls to this position and this position. Right. And what do we know? What is the base condition? The base condition is that you can be if this if you were to reach from source to target as is one, then the only possible way to do that is just one. If your source and target was one comma one, then there is only one way to get there, there and that is the one. There is no other way to get here. But based on that, we can construct the entire solution, right? Because all of these recursive calls in the end have to come to this point. All right, so Let's let me do this one last time. Let me copy this one last time and then I can guide you to the solution. All right, let's do this. So let's begin with this from left. I can say that this is one way to get here. Right? And in order to understand, in order to say that we don't go out of the grid, we place a condition that if we are, uh, I mean, there is no way to get this position and there is no way to get to this position. Right? There's no way to get to these positions. These are out, out of limits. But this one, right? So this, there's one way to get here. In how many ways can we get here? Either we can come from here or from here. So there's only one way again. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, is that, uh, can we assume that the target is always going to be a square, something like a five, five, four, four, three, three, or the solution can apply for any like three, one target this, or two. This solution targets. will apply to anything pretty much. Okay. okay. In the end. Yes. And then this is the one, this is one, this is one. So right. It's a entire first row. You can only get in one way that is to travel this way. Similarly, the first column, right? The only one way to get to this column, there is no other way. There's only one route that covers this column and which is to go down each of these places. So if I ask you in how many ways can you come from this place to this place? Only one way that is this downward way, no other way. Now, what can I say about this position? This can either come from here or from here. So if I know the number of ways to come to this position, and the number of ways to come to this position, then I can sum these two to get the answer here. And that answer comes out to be two. So how many ways you can get here is to sum of these two. Then how many ways you can get to this position? Sum of these two. In how many ways can you get to this position? And five. Now, any question in this, Any question from anybody? How many ways can we get here? Three. So then how many ways can we get here? Six. Remember we were solving this, I interrupted, it, but we were solving this three part and we were drawing this. There were six, six or four, 10. That is 10 right. possible ways to get here. Yeah, the main thing is coming up to the solution. How do we calculate for the end? That is the addition exactly. of the just previous end of, yeah. Yes. That so is exactly. the most analytical part. Okay. 
Yes, that's the most analytical part in all of these situations is that how do you reach n? In Fibonacci, for example, you reach by n minus one and n minus two. In the previous one, we could we were saying n minus one, n minus two, and n minus three. And in this, the problem becomes two-dimensional. If let's say this point is row comma column, then you can get to this place either from row minus one comma column or row comma column of minus one. So you have to do this. And then you can fill this table up and get to this answer here. By if you were going the recursive way, for example, if you're going the recursive way and you were to compute it, compute three comma three, then first you will compute three comma two and then two comma three. Then you will compute two comma two, sorry, two comma two and then three comma one, right? And this recursive recursion tree will grow on. Okay, I'm gonna give you an assignment to find the time complexity of that recursion. Okay, if you were to do this way. But here, given this is n, and this is n, how many computations, computations will I have to do? Can anybody guess? N square. N square, right, exactly. I have to do n square computations to get the answer, which is once again going to be superbly smaller compared to a exponential algorithm. Now, I don't have enough time, it's already eight, to really code this problem now. But I think this problem is a good food for thought for you guys. Without looking up the solution online, try to solve this problem, try to code this up. The approach remains exactly similar. It's just a two dimensional array instead of a one dimensional array, but it is exactly similar to this way in the bottom up and this way in the top down. But try to solve this problem on your own and see if you can get to the solution using the dynamic programming way. This is a good problem for learning dynamic programming. All right. And if you want more action in your life, I can give you one more problem to think about it. Look, uh, let's go here. And can you quickly show how to initialize two dimensional array in Python so that, uh... I mean, you can use whatever language you want. You don't have to use Python whatever you are comfortable with, use that. And if you still need it, then I can post it on the Discord. Essentially in, in, in uh, Python, you just initialize one array and then you multiply it by something. So you can just say zero multiplied by number of rows, and then you can put that in an array and multiply it by column. So oh, simple, okay. but let's just get rid of this. Let me ask you a problem. I know this time is up, but let me ask you a simple problem. We solve the steps problem, right? Consider this steps problem again. And I will cover this problem in the next session as well. Most likely I will try to. Now this time you want, let's say you can go either one step or two step at a time. Okay. Either one or two step at a time. And you have to find the number of ways in which you, no, no, sorry. Let me back up. There are n steps. You have to reach n steps. In order to go to every step, there is a cost associated. Okay, suppose the cost to get to this step is one, zero, one, two, four, one, four, let's say two, something like this. Okay, so if you reach to this path, by this path, where you jump here and then you jump here, one, then the cost becomes two. Then let's say you choose to jump here, then the cost becomes plus four. Then you, let's say, come here, then plus one. And then you need to jump here, plus two. That's your total cost. And the question is, what is the minimum cost in which you can reach the target? All right, what is the minimum cost in which you can reach the target? You know the number of ways to get there but you have to find the minimum of those, a, a way which creates the minimum cost. And my uh, and the question is, what is the minimum amount of cost it will take you to get to this place? Okay, that's a good food for thought. Think about it. 
try to sharpen your brain with this and this will give you a good idea of how dp will work so the, the more practice you do the, the more practice you put up you, the, the better it will become over time and easier it will be to think of such problems let me first stop the recording and then if you have any follow up questions you can ask me